we left off at a very interesting part at the birth of the American nation where the American Revolutionary War was occurring as well uh, at the same time something insidious is going behind the scenes and the insidious part is don't forget those Jesuits and the Jesuits you might recall last time where we left off is where they were kicked out by Catholic nations and including the Pope himself because they were truly a dangerous group of people as you might recall I mean that's a no-brainer that is recorded in history it is recorded in history this is not some kind of a wacky crazy theory or trying to find a conspiracy this is actual history everybody blamed the Jesuits that time that even the Pope had to kick them out that's why there's a true historical event called the uh, Jesuit suppression and that lasted for almost two centuries however I read you documentations if you recall uh, from some of them are scholastic sources and some of them read that the Jesuits their their best time of growing in power was actually not during the time in the Vatican but even during the suppression and it makes you wonder why is that what happened during that time well you might recall they went to Catherine the Great in uh, Russia that's where they fled to and then they were able to work within the educated school system now that's very important to understand where Jesuits go and seep uh, seep their influence and be able to build powerful connections is the schools that's extremely important that's the downfall of America was through the schools okay but the Jesuits were doing that long before and they knew that Hitler one time gave an infamous quote that if he gets all the schools, he'll be able to get the children. That's why currently communist countries, they indoctrinate the students in the schools. That's very important to them. Why? So that once uh, you get uh, 20 to 50 years passing by, you already have a whole population of brainwashed people. That's what's going on in America right now, obviously. I mean, 70 to 80 percent full of liberalism. So it's already a pervasive, strong, dark influence. So the Jesuits were able to uh, enjoy certain benefits uh, through Catherine the Great, but even in England. Now, if they were able to do that in England, as uh, one, of the, one of the quotes that I read to you last discipleship class, then what that can mean is that behind the American Revolutionary War, if America lost the war and England won, Perhaps the Jesuits' influence uh, through England would eventually reach America. Or, uh, which it did, because from England then it did pass to America, but if they conjoined America and England, then it would have spread faster. Now I'm going to show you later on that, as Dr. Altman argued, the downfall of church history started with the revision of the King James Bible. And they went through Westcott and Hort, but all that tied to uh, the Anglican Church and what they called, if I recall, I think it was called the Oxford Tract Movement. But all that was Catholic ties. And this was all in England. This was all in England. So it would have been very, very dangerous. It would have been very, very dangerous for America if England and America was conjoined at that time. But you're going to see those Jesuits where they were able to put the influence on England later on. And then... Because America was separated from England, as you know your history, they had to carry it on through, believe it or not, the school system. Okay? That's how they uh, spread their influence. We're going to go to Psalm 33, verse 12. Psalm 33, verse 12. Now, this is universal uh, for any nation. This is universal for any nation. I'm going to examine two scriptural places that's going to be important to cover tonight. We're going to go to Psalm 33 and verse 12. This is universal for any nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Now it is true that in the second part of that verse 
This is referring to the nation of Israel. So if the nation of Israel follow what God says, then God's going to bless that nation. Amen. However, think about it. If you have a bunch of people in a certain nation who live for the Lord, how could God not bless uh, that nation? Right. So he will. Yes. He will. Amen. That's the reason why I say it's a universal application. Amen. Now, I want to give something very, very important to understand about our American history, which is the balance that you need to learn. Okay. Now, if you read Dr. Upman's church history book and then other Bible believers, I believe Pastor Donovan uh, has some interesting studies in MP3 form about America. I mentioned to you before that there is no doubt that God had his hand in America and that his hand behind America was what caused us to enjoy greatness today. You heard about the pilgrims and then the people during the Great Awakening revivals. And then the Baptists who were able to carry on their churches. And like I told you before, where we get the current government system in America where they talk about democracy and all that comes from the Baptist distinctive. Amen. It came from them first. Amen. From a person, uh, one of the earliest people is Roger Williams. You might recall he was a very controversial Baptist pastor. But his mindset was having the autonomy of the local church. No combination of state and church. That was extremely important. That's one of the most important Baptist distinctives, which is why the Anabaptist who we could say is like early Baptists, even though they're not the first Baptists, but we could say they're like the early Baptists who carried on some similar distinctives as us Baptists today. So the Anabaptists, they suffered tremendous persecution from the Catholic and even Protestant nations. That's important to understand. Protestant and Catholic nations. The Anabaptists suffered persecution under both of them, which is why Baptists were persecuted by their Calvinist brothers and sisters in Christ. They were uh, persecuted by uh, Puritan as well as the Anglican Church which is supposed to be some Protestant. But like I told you, I don't see much of a difference with Anglican Church and Catholic Church. Continuing on, however, that church and state was the problem with John Calvin, with those Protestants, you might recall. The Baptists were the one that stuck out with that separation. That's why America was born. As I've told you before, a lot of the uh, forefathers, they were defending Baptists before they became the famous founding fathers of America. So if I recall from memory, Madison and Jefferson were lawyers for the Baptists because they were getting trouble with that church-state issue. And then later on, during the American Revolutionary War, a lot of people gave credit to Baptists who, uh, who helped out with the American Revolutionary War. Baptists is ingrained in our history. So there's no doubt that there is a Baptist history behind the birth of America Amen. as well. So you can see some good points here in America. Yes. But like I told you before, I'm going to cover Dr. Upman's church history book and also Pastor Donovan, what he mentioned. It's important to understand, however, that I told you that America uh, is a Christian nation. But what I mean by that as a Christian nation is out of any other nation you can think of throughout history, America started with some sort of Baptist or Bible-believing or Christian distinctive and concept. And from that foundation, it was able to grow. However, it's important to understand that holistically, it is not a Christian nation. So let me repeat that again. Holistically, it is not a Christian nation because... If you go to the foundations of America and their birth, they had problems too, okay? Founding fathers, you got to realize this, not all of them were Christians. Majority were deists, okay? Deists, that time, basically they believe there is a God, but what they believe is that when God created the world, then uh, after that, he just left mankind at their own. So then his hand is not behind everything, and he just let man do whatever they want. So man is... It's up to us to build the kingdom and to do everything else. So deists, they don't believe in a, remember this, they do not believe in a Christian God. 
That doesn't mean that they have to believe in the Bible or Jesus Christ. A deist is simply there is a God, he created the world, but left mankind to their own devices. That's just it. Okay? So even a pagan could believe in that, for example. So we have to realize that there was deism behind the scenes. Another thing is this. Now, there's the issue here of government, submission to government. Now, in both sides of the fence, I believe in giving you full information, okay? I don't pick sides. I give you all the information. If there is a side that I will tend to favor more, then I'll mention it. But in this case, in this teaching, I don't pick a side right here. Because Bible believers are very diverse in this. I believe, though, in the following information on both sides, okay? So there's this one side of uh, some Bible-believing preachers who thank God for the American Revolutionary War, and they believe that what they did was right. So, now this is a problem, however. Because of that, they use that as today to stand against the government. So then when Rush Limbaugh, uh, back then, before he passed away, he said stuff like, you know, we have to be like the Boston Tea Party and speak out against the government. And then, you know, Donald Trump mentioned about to surround, uh, to come to Washington, D.C. and help him out. But you know the fiasco at January 6th. It didn't turn out to be that well. And if you uh, recall from my teaching, I did not believe in that. I do not side with that. You might say, why is that? Because it, we got to realize that this is the Antichrist government. This is not God bless America. America is a God-fearing nation. No, it is in total apostasy. And it is in a wicked condition today. So because of that, that's the reason why I cannot act like the American revolutionists or those Baptists back then. We got to realize this is the Antichrist government. And under that, we don't do war. What we do is that we try to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then we do undergo persecution. Right. So then, there are some uh, Bible-believing preachers who will get more involved. So they might vote. They might uh, do a little protest or etc. Depending on the city and county, I have no problem with that. I don't preach against that. Okay? I remember Dr. Upman where... Uh, he announced in his church that there was a group of people who are speaking out against alcohol and having a protest. He said, if you want to join, you want to join. Me, I didn't join because I knew it was pointless. They're not going to ban alcohol, okay? But even the point is this, Dr. Uckman even allowed that. Why? Because I don't criticize that. If you, this is, if you think you can make a difference within a small community or in your terrain or uh, at least get some limited freedom, then go ahead. You can uh, fight for that. You can try to maintain that. You can speak at City Hall if you want to. I'll tell you, though, in my case, that ain't going to work in this Bay Area. That's a joke. That's a laugh, okay? There are some independent fundamental Baptist pastors who thought they could, but they couldn't win. All right, the only one who could win was John MacArthur. Why? Because he's in more of a conservative terrain, okay? I know it's part of Los Angeles County, but nevertheless, you got to realize the terrain he's in is a little bit more conservative area, a part of the huge Los Angeles County, okay? Secondly, he got money, okay? I don't, okay? I don't have money for lawyers, okay? So you got to realize this, is that in my case, that ain't going to work. So in our scenario, the past two years, we had to use wisdom to be able to uh, find ways to keep serving God in a Bible-believing manner without compromise. So every church is going to run differently. And the past two years was evidence of that. And the confusion that it comes down to is this issue, submission to government, okay? So uh, I could be wrong about this, but if I recall from memory... I believe Pastor Donovan did not believe what those American revolutionists did was right. He preaches and criticizes against that. He said they should have submitted to the government. Whereas other Bible-believing preachers would say, no, I'm glad that the, the Baptists stuck their heads out so that we can enjoy the freedom. Me, all I can say is this, is that here are two sides of the information and you're going to have to make your own conclusion. But I believe that both sides have validity and there's something in this spectrum in between where it's right. 
but we're all going to differ in that in-between area. Okay? As long as both sides aren't in the extreme as, you know, submit to the government so much, because I'll tell you one thing is that Pastor Donovan, I mean, even though he mentioned about that, I'll tell you for uh, the past two years, what uh, I'm not saying, okay, so I'm not saying that he did anything illegal, but the past two years when it comes to this t trying to take away Christian worship, and then trying to take them away from serving God, he did not bow the knee to Baal, okay? So you would think that uh, he's contrary, his actions are contrary to what he said about the American Revolutionary War. What's, what am I driving at? What I'm driving that at is, see, uh, he's not like an extremist toward this side, like adoration, submit to the government, whatever they say. No, no, no. Like I said, even though Bible-believing preachers on both sides have different opinions, from what I see is they're not in the extreme on one side or the other. I think that they're all in the middle, but they all just differ how they vary in the middle, okay? That's the idea. So I believe that's the case with our church. I believe that the case to be with every Bible-believing church and pastor. If you don't think so, then Paul would not write Romans 14 to begin with about different spiritual convictions, one. And then number two, you really don't know why we're called an independent Baptist church. Because we all have to be independent from each other because pastor so-and-so of a Bible-believing church is going to run differently from another Bible-believing pastor and church. So that's a Baptist distinctive that we, do, uh, that we do treasure in, that we value in. It's not something to be criticized. Nowadays, you've got Southern Baptist Church, other Baptist churches that are part of a convention. But we were called independent Baptists, so we don't follow that routine. So then in Romans 13, I like how Dr. Upman said it in his Romans commentary. I want you to go to Romans 13. This is the important part concerning about submission to government in Romans 13. Romans 13, 1 through 3, shows that we are to subject to the powers that be. Verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So it shows right here subjection uh, to the government. It also shows right here in verse 6 that they are to pay their taxes. But look at this point. This is important to see. 6 is following the context of submission of government, right? You have to pay your taxes. Verse 7, you are to pay your tribute, your taxes. Custom to, com to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything. So you are not to be in debt to them. That's important. So this is following the context of government. But to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now this is very important because you're thinking about uh, your government, you're thinking about your people, right? So that's why we're not rebel rousers. We are to show love. That's the reason why we submit. That's why we are peaceable citizens. We don't cause a ruckus here. However, Dr. Ruckman mentioned this part, which was very interesting. He mentioned, well, what about the Revolutionary War? And he talked about that during the time of the Revolutionary War, you better realize how much you're willing to pay the cost for it. Yeah. Now, if I did the American Revolutionary War for my church, what do you think the cost I'm going to pay? I ain't going to have a church. Okay, I don't care what you say. I ain't going to run a church. I know this area, okay? I graduated from Berkeley. I lived in this place. You don't. You just watch stuff online and hear news about this liberal area, okay? You don't know, you don't know the community, how it works. I do. That's how I survive, okay? So, in my case over here, I cannot use the Revolutionary War tactics, okay? And no, you stinking trolls out there, I never said I did anything illegal, okay? You can't catch me on that. I never said that, okay? Bottom line of what I said was I had to use wisdom in a way, in a way where I don't compromise the Word of God. And that's how our church survived. Amen. 
So in this case and scenario, you have to count the cost. Here's a second thing to realize. The timeline is different. Now you got to realize this. The timeline is very different. We're living in a day and age where people have no morals. During that time, they at least had morals. So because the timeline is different, like uh, Richard Sowell said, as I mentioned to you, which I recommend American history from a biblical perspective. So he's more on the side of, you know, thank God that I got my freedom due to the Revolutionary War. But he mentioned something which was uh, very uh, important. Even a deist at that time had more morals than a say Baptist today. And I'm not talking about a Bible-believing Baptist, obviously, but just regular Baptists today. Why? Because the morals of that community that time, they had standards somewhere. They weren't tolerating clouds of the rainbow. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. And there are Methodists and even Baptists crying out loud, God forbid, if there are some out there, who tolerate that kind of stuff. And if not the denomination Baptist itself, there are Baptist individuals who do. So this is ridiculousness. This is wickedness. So the timeline is different. So trying right now ain't going to work. You can uh, argue and say, we got thousands. We got uh, people on our side, stuff like that. Well, January 6th sure was evidence that it didn't work for you guys. And then the voting sure proved that it didn't work for you guys either, did it? Why? Because uh, this device does the best counting for you, right? You can trust their vote count. So the point is, it doesn't matter what you think. Because we are already at the point of an immoral society, we're also at a point where, let's be honest, this system right here, this uh, world order system, has so much control already worldwide. Worldwide perspective. We're not talking about during those days where countries were still divided. This is more worldwide now, where different countries are uniting under this system, this Antichrist system. So you got to realize, no, you're not, uh, you can't be a kingdom builder. I don't think you can win another revolutionary war. Okay, that ain't going to happen. Even if you have some temporary victory, Trump being president was evidence that even during his time, I mean, unlike any other president, perhaps, he did the most strides for anything that's really extreme for uh, the Christians or the conservatives. But, his time, uh, but even his actions proved that the world still went worse and worse. What happened? It swung the pendulum to the other side of the extreme where the liberals went really woke power and really left-wing hype. Not repentance, not a change. You know what's going to happen when you do the American Revolutionary War? Simple. You think black lives matter, they're going to live in peace, or they're going to have a revolutionary war like this that's even worse than you guys. See that? Verse 8, I think, is the balance that is helpful, which is why churches can all differ. It says that e this context of submission to government is loving one another. For he that loveth another hath broken the law or fulfilled. Fulfilled. So think about it. If you truly love each other, you're going to look out for your people and your church. Wow. Yes. So in my case, doing a revolution is not showing love to my own people. It's going to harm them more. So that's the reason why I can't do that. But think about it. For these guys during their time, if you lived under their days, and if you're a colonist living in their days, where soldiers just walked inside your house and then you had to give them board, and that they cut off a lot of the commerce and trade, so then uh, your food supply is lowering, and then even when you're making hats, you have to go by England's restrictions and etc., and uh, the sources are from Richard Sowell's American History from a Biblical Perspective, which is interesting. Then how would you feel? Would that be loving each other if you had some soldier just walk inside your wife's uh, bedroom? I don't think so, right? 
you, if you had that concept of loving each other, I love my wife, my family, so no, I cannot let you walk inside my home, yeah. right? Yes. See, so that thing, I believe, that verse points out right here, this is, you don't break the law in verse 8. You fulfill the law. Amen. So it depends on the context of how you love each other. Yeah. So I think that shows that middle line between these two extremes. And they're all going to differ. They're all going to differ. Think about it. It's one thing where, you know, uh, soldiers, uh, let's say that soldiers uh, storm in, they arrest me and my children, all right? And I'm suffering persecution for the name of Jesus. But it's another thing when a soldier puts a hand on my little girl and daughter and does something really messed up, how can I as a father just comply and submit? and suffer persecution? Or do you think I'll honestly fight for my little girl? Amen. See that? So you got to realize this, is that when you truly love each other, are you going to fight for them? Or are you going to uh, submit to the government? Or are you going to find ways in between? Or do you know what I mean, Jelly Bean? See that? There are people who are rebel rousers who are upset with the IRS. Look, I'm not happy with the Internal Revenue Service either, but that's how the world works. But one guy thinks that uh, I hate it, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to take a stand against it. You know, this is not constitutional. This is not the American Revolutionary War. And then that guy has his family all wrecked and messed up. Whoa. That shows how much he loves his family. See that? But let's pretend we're in the American Revolutionary War. And then you loved your family. It might be different, right? So that's the reason why that's a great balance that I want you all to remember is Romans 13, 1 through 8. Okay? You can include verse 9 if you want. Okay? 9 and 10. So in context of submission to government, the idea is this. The context of submitting to government is how you love one another how you love people around you, okay? Amen. Another thing to understand about the balance is that none of the documentations are biblical or scriptural when America was founded. Okay, I know that's shocking, but none of it is biblical or scriptural. I might have said in the last lesson that there might be some form of Bible, some form of Christian or moral, but holistically, it's not. There's only one, there's only one that you can use for the Constitution that Dr. Upton mentioned in his church history book. He argues that none of it was Christian, and you can't argue for Christian. You can't sing God Bless America because it doesn't really start out that way, okay? It starts out as, a, like all other nations, something secular, it starts out that way. However, there is something more Christian about it compared to all other nations, when you look at one thing, and that is the one thing which matches with the Baptist distinctive, you might recall. And that is the freedom of speech part. The freedom of speech with religious liberty. You know why they did that? I'll tell you why. It's because you got the church state telling you no, you can't say that. You can't preach that in your church. So they didn't have the religious li liberty, and thus they didn't have such freedom of speech. So the Baptist church is born from that concept that, no, I have a right to speak for myself. I have my own religious freedom. So because of that, that's why they were really involved with the American Revolutionary War. They didn't want anyone to control them on that one. So because of that one thing which they got, uh, which they didn't adopt themselves, they got it from the Baptist churches. They got Baptists to thank. Baptist churches have started with that one. That's why the American government today owe a lot, believe it or not, to the Baptist. Because if it wasn't for this one, you wouldn't get your American government and enjoy your democracy. Amen. How about that? How about that? So that's pretty strong to think about. That's pretty strong to consider. Another thing concerning about the history of that time during the American Revolutionary War, remember this. I told you about those Jesuits, right? Yeah. The Catholic influence. Because of that Jesuit influence, I mentioned if America lost to England, 
the Jesuits or the Catholic uh, underground power could have seeped in even more quickly. Yeah. They could have seeped in much more quickly. Right. But because of that uh, American Revolutionary War and America separated from that, it, uh, it delayed it. It delayed it a bit. And the Jesuits had to work even harder to try to infiltrate into America. You got to realize how important this history is. This is a very pivotal time. Otherwise, we Bible-believing churches wouldn't have had the freedom and the growth of knowledge to do what we do. One thing is from... Let's see right here. Let's go back to the French and Indian War. That was before the American Revolutionary War. Now, you might recall that George Washington was involved in the battle at that time. In the French and Indian War, you got to realize who was colonizing the New World that time. You remember? A lot of them were Catholics. Remember that? Majority were Catholics who colonized. Now, if you recall, France... And Spain, they're heavily influenced by Catholicism. England was the only one that broke off thanks to King Henry VIII. So then England was Anglican. Now remember, these are the three, these are the big three that own the Americas. Okay, Baptists were able to get into America and have some form of freedom, even though they're still controlled by England, but some form of freedom away from Catholic power is because of England, right? So in English territory, they were able to do that, and the Baptists were able to plant something. The French and Indian War was when these, nation, these two nations fought together. Now think about it. If this nation won... What would happen? The Catholics could take control of the New World. The Catholics would have taken that, and the Baptists would have been in danger of losing their freedom and their churches. As a matter of fact, you, you thought that scalping was something from the natives, huh? No, the, uh, the scalping was not from the natives, believe it or not. They learned it from the French. The French Catholics. Why? Remember the Catholic Inquisition. They're experts in torture. You didn't know that, did you? So this was founded in uh, Richard Sowell's um, audio on American history from a biblical perspective. So I'm giving you everything from him. So we know that England uh, won, thankfully, so France couldn't win. Now, what about the Spanish territories? You know how England was able to take some of the Spanish territories? It's because Spain, they helped out France in some things. So because they lost, England was able to take some territories from Spain as well. You've got to realize that this was extremely dangerous. This is a very significant time because uh, you got the Catholics all uh, from the north. Remember, if we are looking at Massachusetts and then Rhode Island, where, uh, where the Baptists were at, or uh, somewhere in the 13 colonies, you got the north, which is French territory, and then you got some parts in the south and maybe even the west that are Spanish Catholic territories. They're surrounded. They're surrounded. The Catholics is just encroaching, about to get into them. But they were able to win and put a boundary line. And they were able to prevent that. You know, George Washington, it is very crazy, but there was a native who met George Washington after the American Revolutionary War and told him that he was there shooting at George Washington back at the French and Indian War. And he said, I shot you seven times. And you were filled with bullet holes. But it didn't hit you until the great spirit told me to leave that, leave that man alone. So I told my men, don't shoot that man. Don't shoot at that man. The great spirit said no. That's crazy how the Lord's hand was behind it. But if you recall, that was the same thing 
with the pilgrims and the King Philip's War that was before the French and Indian War. When uh, some of the uh, generations that came from the pilgrims and then the other people, they had the war, the natives were afraid of their religion, their God. And remember during the Thanksgiving that they had the first Thanksgiving, even the chief at the second Thanksgiving uh, gave honor to and credit to the pilgrims and their God because they had a harvest that was more than their own yeah. at the second Thanksgiving, even though they, uh, the natives helped out in the first one. So see, there's no doubt that God's hand was behind all of this. Amen. Here's something extremely dangerous that could have uh, happened if... America didn't win the American Revolutionary War. Even though England won, you know what they did? They de-established the Anglic Anglican Church in the Catholic territories. Now, what does that mean? If they de-established the Anglican Church, that they got the territories from uh, France and Spain, this, uh, it doesn't mean, oh, no church and state, whoopee, no. It shows right here that the Catholics, they can still practice their church and state thing. Hmm. So that's why this was very significant, the American Revolutionary War, where they had to win. If they didn't win, then Catholicism would have landed in America a long time ago, although it already has a foothold now. But it would have made its foothold a long time ago. Believe it or not, even Thomas Jefferson saw this. So he warned about this. Why do you think uh, Democrats, and isn't it interesting that majority of them have Catholic schooling or Catholic background or Catholic by religion, and they always push this immigration thing? You know why that's important? Thomas Jefferson warned about this. It's because when the Catholics immigrate into America, he was afraid it would change the statistics of what they've always wanted a long time ago. A long time ago, these people want to be away from that Catholic church state power. But then when you get the immigrants coming in and bringing in Catholicism, then that's, it's going to bring in the nightmare again. But you don't have to believe me. Thomas Jefferson warned about that. But today's world, they're too blind. They don't see that, obviously. So this is from Thomas Jefferson. And then I'll read his quote from William Grady's book, How Satan Turned America Against God. The present desire in America is to produce rapid population by as great importations of foreigners as possible. But is this founded in policy? Are there no inconveniences to be thrown into the scale against the advantage expected from a multiplication of numbers by the importation of foreigners? It is for the happiness of those united in society to harmonize as much as possible in matters which they must of necessity transact together. Civil government being the sole object of forming societies, its administration must be conducted by common consent. Every species of government has its specific principles. Ours, perhaps, is more peculiar than those of any other in the universe. It is a composition of the freest principles of the English Constitution, which with others derive from natural right and natural reason. To these, nothing can be more opposed than the maxims of absolute monarchies. So he's really, uh, he's really scared about this uh, monarchy powers that are coming in. Yet from such, we are to expect the greatest number of emigrants. They will bring with them the principles of the governments they leave. Yes. So then the Catholic Church state, right? Imbibed in their early youth, or if able to throw them off, it will be in exchange for, for an unbounded uh, for an unbounded licentiousness, passing as is usual from one extreme to another. It would be a miracle were they to stop precisely at the point of temperate liberty. These principles with their language, they will transmit to their children in proportion to their numbers. They will share with us the legislation. They will infuse into it their spirit warp and bias its directions and render it a heterogeneous, incoherent, distracted mass. Yeah, that's, that's a no-brainer. I'll even admit that. If you had a bunch of Baptists immigrating, 
you know, into a particular state, what are you going to expect inside the legal offices? Baptist bias. No, we're not fair people. One thing I learned is everybody is biased, no matter how non-biased you claim to be. All right. Everyone is biased. Even scientists admitted that in their scientific journals that are peer reviewed that you can't separate bias from there. You can't separate bias from there. I may appeal, to, so this is, this is a, I, I, I better finish this quote, it's pretty good. I may appeal to experience for a verification of these conjectures, but if they were not certain in event, are they not possible? Are they not probable? Well, it's more than that. We're seeing it right now. Now, this guy was way ahead. Now, Thomas Jefferson, to my knowledge, is not a saved person, okay? He, I don't think he ever got saved. He was always a deist. But like I told you, this guy had more sense. This guy had more sense than some apostate Baptist today. Is it not safer to wait with patience for the attainment of any degree of population desired or expected? May not our government be more homogenous, more peaceable, and more durable? He asked what would be the condition of France if 20 millions of Americans were suddenly imported into that kingdom. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. And adds... If it would be more turbulent, less happy, less strong, we may believe that the addition of half a million of foreigners would produce a similar effect here. Yeah, stop picking on America, you know. What about the other countries? You should see Europe. And, the, oh, we all want to be like Europe. You should see Europe, how they uh, do immigration, some of them. Okay, so there's a lot of gold mines I've given to you. This is very important, as I've told you before, about the birth of the nation to where we came to be. It was able to open the doors to a lot of things where we Baptists were able to have a strong influence into this country until years later where the Jesuits were able to infiltrate the schools. The elites through the Freemasons were able to seep in and then get the television, get the school, seep into the governments, and then the population changed with immigration as well. So all it takes is time, though, through those means. It takes time. And look at us today. It did change. It did change. Far be it to the early days of America. It's nowhere even close to that. Nowhere close. When the Founding Fathers and the early American leaders spoke out against the king and then in England, and then they wanted to fight for their rights. They uh, signed on a piece of paper, and then you get the famous Declaration of Independence. No, that's not a Christian document, okay? So sorry. The only thing was, like I've told you, was during that Constitution, that rule about religious liberty, freedom of speech. That's the only thing, okay? But the Declaration of Independence was signed to speak out and... John Hancock, he's the one that uh, wrote the biggest signature on a certain piece of paper. That's the reason why you, you hear the uh, saying, John Hancock signature. Put in your John Hancock. You know why? He's, he's the one that signed it real big. Well, everybody signed it small. You know why? He wanted to show, okay, whether this guy was a believer or not, he had more uh, moral, he had more of a stance. This guy wrote the biggest signature to point out, I want the king to see who, who I am. That I, I, that to see my name, put me in his target. I don't care, I'll take a stand. And actually, he even said this. This is surprising. He says, we should ask God to forgive us of our sins. Amen. Yeah. That speaks bigger than some, of, <laughs> some Christians today. Yeah. How about that? The enforcement of a Catholic church state, or if not an enforcement, the de-establishing of the Anglican church would come from what is called the, this is important, the Quebec Act. Quebec Act. If you're a Baptist hearing that one, if you're a person influenced by the Great Awakening revivals hearing that one, what would you be scared of? You'd be scared of the Dark Ages coming back again. The Catholic Church state coming back, the Inquisition or whatever. Yeah. Wasn't it a coincidence that this was two years before the American Revolutionary War? Hmm. See, it showed the tensions were high. 
that the people were truly concerned about this. They were very concerned. Benedict Arnold, as you have heard before, he's the infamous name who betrayed uh, his own people in the American Revolutionary War. But believe it or not, he, was, he used to be a respected general. It's very interesting that uh, him and Ethan Allen uh, would compete each other uh, during the American Revolutionary War. Ethan Allen, it speaks a difference with Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen's spiritual lives which is important to understand, which makes sense why he came out a traitor later on, Benedict Arnold. But Ethan Allen, he had a group called the Mountain Boys, and they were expert in guerrilla warfare. Do you know why the colonists were able to win the first battle in the American Revolutionary War at Concord? This is important. You can see God's hand behind the scene all the way. Go back to the pilgrims. They got help from who? The natives. They've learned even fighting from the natives, how to uh, scavenge uh, for food and everything. British soldiers, when they do warfare, they always do that marching and the parade. But then, I think George Washington did say this quote before, if we're going to win, uh, win against the Indians, he said this during the French and Indian War, if we're going to win against the, Indian, uh, the Indians, we got to learn how to fight like Indians. The colonists learned that from the natives. That's why in the King Philip's War, they were able to uh, fight against the natives because of the warfare tactics that they learned from them. And the Lord was able to use that where they were able to carry it on to the American Revolutionary War and they were able to beat the British soldiers at the first battle. And eventually they won the entire American Revolutionary War. Richard Sowell mentioned uh, in his uh, history lesson that the British soldiers, they would, all, they would sometimes get a view of George Washington and by the time they reach over there, he's gone. See, I mean, they've learned these hiding tactics, these uh, battle skill tactics, and the Brit that just annoyed the British. Every time they fought a battle, they tried to chase after George Washington. One of the winning, uh, winning tactics of George Washington was whenever the British tried to capture him, he was always gone. So then they would always go on a wild goose chase. So that always annoyed the British soldiers. Ethan Allen's boys were experts in guerrilla warfare. And Ethan Allen would always pray. And he would always give the compliment to the Lord. There was just one time that they just entered inside a British territory. No sentry. And then gate was practically pretty much you can just open it and go through. And then Benedict Arnold said, well, it's just a coincidence or something like that. But you know what Ethan Allen said? He said, no, it was the Lord. Amen. It was the Lord. So you have to realize and understand how, why Benedict Arnold would come out the bad apple that he is, it's always from a secular standpoint. But when you start out from a spiritual standpoint, notice that in the American Revolutionary War how God's blessing can be upon it. Okay? So remember this. I am not approving what these people did during the American Revolutionary War. But even if what they did was something wrong, if you have some kind of Christian fiber or Baptist fiber in you, there is going to be some sort of blessing from God somewhere in there. Okay? There's no doubt about that. So you can see throughout every moment in American history how God's hand was behind it and how it built up to this. So that's why it's so important to understand our history as America and how there was some kind of Christian or Baptist principle to where we came, where we we're able to come out to where we are today. All right. So it's very important to remember this. Don't forget the Jesuits, though. Never forget the Jesuits. So remember, they were, uh, during their suppression, they're going underground. They're trying to do what they can to continue on their power. And I've told you that their power grew more during the suppression than even during their time in the Vatican, according to s some people. You might say, why is that? The birth of everything where you're going to get uh, elites, Illuminati, or the top of the pyramid is during this timeline as well. 
which is why I'm telling you this is probably one of the most important timelines if you live in America or I'm not saying in the world all right but the most important timeline if for you Bible believing Christians who live in America okay it's the birth of our the nation the American Revolutionary War and the birth of the Jesuit dark order where they were able to structure their pyramid so Jesuits if they were behind the scenes trying to infiltrate within America, then there's going to be a group that undoubtedly you will hear that you cannot separate, and that's the Masons. The Masons. So as I've told you before, that uh, George Washington, he is not a Mason, and the evidence of it is from William Grady's book. He was, uh, he was heavily influenced by a Baptist pastor. He even received baptism. And then... Uh, I cannot say if he is 100% a saved man, even though that's pretty hard for a Baptist because a Baptist pastor needs to make sure, usually you know what they are, Baptist pastors make sure you're saved, so then after that, then they baptize you. Remember, that's a very big principle in Anabaptist, and not just Anabaptist, but even all the way to the beginning of church history. Baptism was the... I'm tying everything again, but let me just do it. Remember, baptism was the most, one of the most foundational things ever in church history that distinguished us from the Catholic Church and all other cultists Amen. during that time. Amen. So then the Donatists practiced things differently, Albigenses, uh, Albigenses Waldenses, Vazois, Anabaptists, etc. But the doctrine of baptism was a key distinction that separated the Catholic heretics from the Bible believers. Amen. So I can't imagine, you know, a Baptist pastor doing that to an unsaved man because that's a foundational thing to Baptists, right? So there's a, there is a good chance that Washington is saved. But if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. That's why I won't say 100%, okay? So then why is it that there's Masonic ties here, right, with George Washington? Why is there Masonic ties when you look above the Washington, D.C.? There is no doubt. You see a pentagram thing, okay? You see Masonic symbols everywhere. You can't separate Masonic symbols from D.C. when you visit there. Masonry is everywhere. Okay. How can Jesuits have uh, this tie to the Masons, right? Well, this, the, here are some very interesting quotes. This is from uh, G.B. Nicolini, History of the Jesuits, The Origin, Progress, Doctrines, and Designs. This is from the Scholar's Choice Award as well. I would highly recommend that book. It goes on to its history there that time. It's rich in that. During the order's suppression from 1773 to 1814 by Pope Clement XIV, so that's the Jesuit order suppression. General Ricci, so that's the Jesuit general. He was the 18th superior general from 1758 to 1775. Created the order of the Illuminati with his soldier Adam Weishaupt, uniting the house of Rothschild with the Society of Jesus. Okay, that's a lot from just one quote right there. That's a lot. So everything you heard about the big boys in the top of the pyramid is right here. Supposedly, the general got together these guys. But let's keep reading here. Uh, I'll explain about Adam Weishaupt and the House of Roth, uh, Rothschild a little bit more later on, but I'm just showing you the tie with the Masons and Jesuits, okay? Here's another one. This is from Emmanuel M. Josephson in the book The Federal Reserve Conspiracy and Rockefellers, who's a physician and a historian. Quote, Weishaupt and his fellow Jesuits cut off the income to the Vatican by launching and leading the French Revolution, by directing Napoleon's conquest of Catholic Europe, by the revolt against the church led by such priests as Father Hidalgo in Mexico and Latin America, by eventually having Napoleon throw Pope Pius VII in jail and Avignon until he agreed as a price for his release to reestablish the Jesuit order. This Jesuit war on the Vatican was terminated by the Congress of Vienna and by the, se by the secret 1822 Treaty of Verona. Ever since, the Rothschilds have been the fiscal agents of the Vatican. Okay, that's a lot too, okay? And we're going to go one by one in the historical points here. 
later on. Here's where it's more clear about Masons. This is from, uh, let's see right here. The book called Masonic Quiz Book uh, from William O. Peterson. All right, this is a Masonic quiz book, so let's see what they even admitted. Chevalier de Bonville formed a chapter of 25 degrees of the so-called high degrees in the college of where? Of Jesuits of Claremont in Paris in 1754. Where those degrees of Scotch Freemasonry come from is at that college. Isn't that funny? The adherents of the House of Stuart had made the, made the College of Claremont their asylum, they being mostly Scotchmen, one of these degrees being the Scottish Master. So there's your Scottish right to masonry. The new body organized in Charleston, South Carolina in 1801 gave the name of Scottish right to these degrees, which name ever since that time has characterized the right all over the world. Here's uh, the grand design exposed by John Daniel. Page 302. Quote, The truth is, the Jesuits of Rome have perfected Freemasonry to be their most magnificent and effective tool, accomplishing their purposes among Protestants, yet remaining completely hidden and unknown. Here's another quote by... Let's see right here. You wouldn't believe who quoted this, all right? But I'll give the quote first. It is curious to note, too, that most of the bodies which work these, such as the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, okay, masonry, the Rite of Avignon, the Order of the Temple, Temple, Fesler's Rite, the Grand Council of the Emperors of the East and West Sovereign Prince Masons, etc., are nearly all the offspring of the sons of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. The Baron Hunt, Chevalier Ramsey, Schaudi, Zinnendorf, uh, and numerous others who founded the grades in these rites, worked under instructions from the general of the Jesuits. The nest where these high degrees were hatched, and no Masonic rite is free from their baleful influence, more or less, was the Jesuit College of Claremont at Paris. You know who said that? Helena Blavatsky. The, that occultist woman of the Theosophy Society. From her book, Isis Unveil. Okay, I don't... Uh, I'll be honest, I don't believe every single thing in these quotes, okay? But there are two things that disturb me. One, some of these are from scholars or uh, noble classes. Two, why is it, if uh, this is ridiculous, that these, uh, these several different authors say the same thing? That there is some kind of, at least, at least, a Jesuit tie to the Freemason. So the specifics, I'm not sure, but there's one thing that I do believe, that the Jesuits have a tie to Masons. There's no doubt about that one, all right? Or they had some kind of workings with them, some kind of dealings with them. Or at the very least, if you don't believe in anything that I've said, the spirit behind the Jesuits is the same spirit that works behind the Masons. Amen. That much any Christian can believe in. Amen. So, if they are working with the Masons, what did the Masons have to do with our American history and how they pervaded our governments? Next time, all right? <laughs> Next time, I'm going to give you all the Masonic influences, and if there's some time, I will tell you about the infamous Illuminati, where all the, where all the people talk about where all the globalists and the elitist pyramid comes from, okay? It was at this time of history. That's why it's very important to know this history, okay? And then, Lord willing, I'll show you how the Jesuits were able to regain their power again through Napoleon Bonaparte. He's an important guy. He's coming out a little bit later. He just came out just a little bit later. But supposedly, the Jesuits used him to get vengeance back at the Vatican, at the Catholic nations, at their Protestant nations, and even the Pope himself, because he
he, uh, the Vatican kicked them out. Supposedly, though. But let's see the full story behind that next time. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers. We have a full understanding of our history and the right spiritual convictions as Christian and how we should treat our American patriotism, Heavenly Father. Uh, Lord, I do know that uh, us, particularly in this church, we don't practice that one because of how much godlessness there is in it. However, uh, I am very thankful, at least, Heavenly Father, for the Baptist distinctive and for whatever freedom or blessing that came out of that so that we can serve you as much as we could. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that today we cannot regain that Baptist distinctive, obviously, or the glory days of the American Revolution, obviously because of so much evil and how your coming is even closer than before. But I pray that we will do the right thing and every Bible believer will do the right thing in their own ways to uh, follow your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.